Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you all today is yet another very devastating case. I feel like a lot of these types of cases have been popping up because it's genuinely something that I really want to understand. Why does it happen? What are the reasons for these parents wanting to harm their children? And in this case, it's just absolutely bizarre to say the very least. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to Hungry Root for partnering with me on today's video. Hungry Root is an online grocery service that makes it easy to eat healthy based on your own personal preferences, needs, goals, and tastes. So you start off by taking a short fun quiz where you talk about yourself and what you like to eat. Then based on the results of that quiz, Hungry Root sends you personalized weekly deliveries filled with groceries along with 10 minute recipes. You can edit your weekly deliveries and choose exactly what you wanna receive, or you can let Hungry Root choose for you. Then when your delivery arrives on your doorstep, you can mix and match them with the groceries in your fridge, or you can use the easy recipes that they have put together for you. Then the more you shop and cook with Hungry Root, the more the personalization engines learns what you like. The things I love about Hungry Root is that it takes the stress out of shopping and meal planning by giving simple, fast recipes. I love that they cater to so many different dietary needs. I also love that I can discover many new products and varieties of meals that will fit my dietary preferences. I know that I'm someone, I'm a pretty picky eater, so a lot of the typical delivery services don't always work out for me because they don't always cater to what I need and cater to what I like. I'm also someone where I get into the habit of having like a Monday meal and then a Tuesday meal and then I do that same types of meals every day for multiple weeks until I get bored enough to look up new recipes but then I never know what kind of recipe I want and I never know where to look. In my Hungry Root box, I put that I am a vegetarian, I like American and Italian foods, my goals are quick, easy recipes and discovering new meals, and I let them pick exactly what they thought that I would like. I was very pleasantly surprised when I opened my box. So many delicious vegetarian options and new foods that I've never tried before. They also gave me plenty of snacks to eat as well because I love me some snack food. Right now, Hungry is offering a special discount for my viewers. The first 100 people to use my link down below and use my code RACHELSHANNON40 will get 40% off of your first grocery order with Hungry Root. Again, use the link in my description box below and use code RACHELSHANNON40 for 40% off of your first box with Hungry Root. Thank you again so much to Hungry Root for partnering with me on today's video and for your support of my channel. It's because of sponsors like Hungry Root that I'm able to continue making videos that I love and sharing these very important stories. With that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the devastating case of Roxy and Khalil Coleman. Matthew Taylor Coleman had a wife of four years, Abby Coleman, and together they had two children, a two-year-old son, Kaleo, and a 10-month-old daughter, Roxy. The family lived in California, and Matthew was the owner and founder of Love Water, a surfing school in Santa Barbara that offered private and group lessons to children and adults. The biography on the company's website described Matthew as a champion surfer and a youth mentor who enjoyed spearfishing and sailing. Parents whose children were taught by Matthew said that he was always known to be very patient and kind. He could relate well to the children that he taught, and the kids loved him. He was funny, always making dad jokes, and was a really great teacher. Parents trusted him with their children. Some parents said that he had this natural gift for surfing and teaching others his skill. He was always in the water and he was always looking for that next wave. Others said that Matthew embodied what it was like to have this perfect life with wonderful children and a loving wife. Those who knew the couple said that they were deeply in love. Matthew did everything in his power to make Abby feel special and loved on anniversaries, birthdays, and other special occasions. He also doted over his children. He was constantly posting about how much he loved being a father to his two adorable children, how much he loved them, and how proud he was to call himself Abby's husband and Kaleo and Roxy's father. But that life would be cut short for the entire family, and some people think that conspiracy theories are to blame. 
On August 7th, 2021, Abby and Matthew were packing up for a family camping trip that they were supposed to be leaving for that day. However, all of a sudden, Matthew abruptly decided to put their two kids in their Mercedes Sprinter van and he drove off with them. He wouldn't answer any of Abby's calls or text messages, and she had no idea where he was planning on taking the children. Confused and very concerned, Abby called the police to report this. She told the authorities that the two weren't arguing or anything like that before he left, that he just suddenly up and left. She was mostly concerned because he wouldn't answer her text messages and didn't know where they were going. She also was concerned because Matthew didn't put either of the kids in their car seats either. However, Abby told the police that she didn't necessarily think that her children were in danger. She didn't think that there was any chance that Matthew would want to harm the children. She thought that he would eventually return with the kids, so she didn't request any further action at that time. However, by the following day, Matthew still hadn't returned home with the kids. He wasn't responding to any of her messages or the attempts at contact that the other family members and the police were making. So, by the afternoon of August 8th, Police asked Abby if she could see Matthew's location on Find My iPhone, and she did. Matthew's location showed that he had actually left the country, and he was in Rosarito, Baja, California, in Mexico. At that point, police were notified of what Matthew and the children looked like, and they kept an eye out to see if and when Matthew would return back to the U.S. from Mexico. Using the Find My iPhone feature, police saw that Matthew was actually headed back to the U.S. on August 9th. It showed that he was by the San Isidro point of entry, so police in Santa Barbara notified the police in San Diego of Matthew and requested that they do a welfare check upon his entry into the U.S. However, by 1 p.m. that day, when Matthew arrived at the port of entry, he was pulled over for inspection of the van. Police found that Matthew was the only one inside of that van, so the children were missing. Of course, Matthew was taken by Border Protection, who then searched the van more thoroughly. When doing so, they found what appeared to be blood on the registration paperwork of the van. Upon this discovery, FBI agents contacted the Mexican authorities to inform them of the two missing children who were likely in Mexico. After they told the authorities about the ages of the children, Mexican authorities told the FBI that they had actually located two children at around 8 a.m. that morning on August 9th. While on his way to work, there was a man living on a ranch in an area about an hour south of Tijuana, Mexico, and he noticed that his dog started barking and started running towards a specific location through the bush. So, the man followed his dogs to see what they were trying to look at, and that is when he found the bodies of two toddlers lying in a pool of blood at the base of a tree. Of course, these bodies turned out to be that of two-year-old Kaleo and nine-month-old Roxy. Upon inspection of their bodies, authorities found that they each had a large puncture wound in their chest cavities. Initially, it was thought that both children had been murdered by being stabbed by some sort of wooden objects. Upon this discovery, of course, Matthew was quickly arrested and taken in for interrogation, and almost immediately, Matthew Coleman confessed that he had murdered both of his young children. He explained that on Saturday, August 7th, 2021, he took his two children and placed them in the van. Because he didn't have their car seats, he said that he placed Roxy in a box in the van. He said that he drove south into Mexico. They lived about three hours north of the U.S.-Mexico border, so it wasn't too far of a drive. He said that at around 5 a.m. on August 8th, he pulled off to the side of the road in an area called Rancho del Celo. He said that he then used a spear fishing gun to murder his two children. He said that he first killed Roxy by shooting a spear into her heart, and then he did the same to Cleo, but he didn't die right away. He said that he had to move the spear around in the chest cavity to actually kill him, 
which caused Matthew to cut his own hand in the process. After murdering his two young children, he said that he moved their bodies about 30 yards away from where he killed them and then placed them in some bush located in a shallow ditch. The location that he told authorities was consistent with where Mexican authorities had already found these two children. After that, he said he drove a few miles away and then discarded the bloody spears and the bloody clothes near a creek. He threw the clothes in a blue trash bin somewhere on the side of the road in Tijuana. Police would later find the discarded items, including the spear and spear gun, bloody clothes, as well as a baby blanket. So, you might be asking, what would drive a seemingly normal, happy family man to kill his own children in such a horrifying and sudden way? Well, like I said earlier, he blamed conspiracy theories. He told the authorities that he was enlightened by QAnon and the Illuminati conspiracy theories. He said that he was receiving visions and signs which revealed that his wife, Abby, possessed serpent DNA and had passed it on to his children. He said that he thought that his children were going to grow into monsters, so he had to kill them to save the world from the monsters that his children would eventually be. When he was asked whether or not he knew what he did was wrong, he said that he knew it was wrong but he said that it was the only course of action that he could take that would save the world. So let's pause for just a minute and talk about exactly what QAnon is and what the people who follow it believe in. So QAnon is an umbrella term for a set of internet conspiracy theories that allege that the world is run by elitist pedophiles who worship Satan. Followers of QAnon believe that top political figures like Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, and George Soros, as well as celebrities like Oprah Winfrey, Ellen DeGeneres, and Tom Hanks, as well as religious figures like Pope Francis and the Dalai Lama, are all involved in pedophilia and satanic worship. Followers of QAnon believe that these elitists molest children and then will murder and eat the blood of their victims to extract adrenochrome, which they believe will make them young forever. The person who started the QAnon movement basically just goes by cues and posts on anonymous websites. He is an anonymous poster who claims to be a high-ranking government official who has access to government secrets and top-secret files. Followers of QAnon believe that Donald Trump was recruited by top military officials to run for president in 2016 to finally break up this band of criminal conspirators and bring these pedophiles to justice. They think that the election was stolen from Trump in 2020 to prevent him from exposing this elitist group and their activities. That is sort of the main element of QAnon, but there are more things behind the curtains. They say that the movement is constantly evolving because there is constantly more conspiracy theories being added to the conversation. We will come back more to this in a few minutes, but that is what you should know just for now. So as police went further in their investigation, obviously they wanted to search across Abby and Matthew's devices to see if they could find out more about the couple and their states of mind when all of this occurred. They discovered that Abby and Matthew had actually been texting on the day of the murder. On August 9th at 3.12 a.m., Matthew sent Abby a text saying, Hi babe, miss you too. Things have been rough, but starting to get some clarity as well. Still confused on a lot of things though and processing through them. So many crazy thoughts going through my head right now, hard to explain. Yeah, funny you're getting some clarity through grandma's old Bibles. Wasn't there too? Anyways, was actually still thinking of burning them in case there's a chip in them or something going to keep processing through everything and hope to get some answers. Hope all this craziness ends soon. Love you. This text message from Matthew was two hours before Matthew admits that he brought his children to the side of the road and murdered them using a spear. It turned out that when Matthew was staying in Mexico, he had been staying at the City Express Hotel in Rosarito, Mexico. He was there for two days before August 9th. That is when, like when he was at the hotel, that's when these bizarre thoughts started creeping into his mind and that is when he decided to kill his children. One of the employees at the hotel that he was at reports seeing Matthew at the hotel with his children. 
The worker said that Matthew and his children stood out to them because they were attractive and this employee was wondering where the children's mother was but the employee just assumed that the mother was already at the pool. The employee said that on that day, Matthew was seen talking to his children, smiling at them, and behaving completely normally for how you'd expect a dad to be interacting with his children. Another employee even reports hearing Matthew saying, you'll see mommy soon. The whole time though, employees say that Matthew didn't interact with any of them, only his own children. Then by 9.24 a.m. that same day, Abby texts Matthew saying, we are doing this together, babe, praying for your clarity over you and your mind this morning. Everything you've believed and known to be true is happening right now. I'm partnering with you from SB. Let's take back our city, the gateway of revival for the state of California and the nation and the world. You were created to change the course of world history. Take care of my little giant slayer and the voice of heaven's dove. They sure are special. Then, as we know, it was that afternoon that Matthew would be detained while crossing the border back into the U.S. After the initial interview, police were able to ask more questions and find out even more about the state of mind that Matthew had when he was murdering his children. So, Matthew said that about five or six days before the murders, he started noticing some strange coincidences. He told them all about QAnon and the Illuminati, as well as Strong's numbers. These numbers are basically an index of words in the Bible that are associated with numbers. So basically, the word will be associated with a snippet of text, and then there will be a number to the right of that scripture, and that is Strong's numbers. This allows the reader to look up the meaning of the original language word in the dictionary. This allows that reader to know the original word that was translated into English. Matthew also talked about how there are reptilians and lizard people walking the earth. He then started talking about how he saw visions and signs that his wife again had serpent DNA and passed that DNA to his children. He said that he wasn't sure if his wife was a shapeshifter, but he knew that she passed her serpent DNA onto her children. He said that the corrupted DNA would spread and infect the world if he didn't do anything about it. He said that he's either crazy or he is the only true man left in the world. He said that while he was laying in bed in Mexico, he started seeing all of these pieces being decoded like you see in the Matrix. He said that his true name, is Neil Coleman. He said that his children also started communicating with him. He said that Kaleo told him that Abby and family friends were abusing the two of them. He said that the two of them communicated to him different ideas about placing babies in fireworks, food, and walls. He said that all of these different pieces allowed Matthew to see the bigger picture, which is that he had to kill his children to prevent them from becoming an alien species that would release carnage all over the earth. He explained that he was scrolling through social media and noticed that many different individuals that he knew were doing hand signals to show that they were all a part of this conspiracy. He said that he saw a photo of his friend doing a hand signal over his eye. He accused the part of being a part of the conspiracy and the friend denied it, obviously, but then Matthew accused him of being a loyalist which is why the friend couldn't see that he was being controlled. After seeing this gesture, he said that he knew the whole thing was a setup and that they were using people to get to him. He said that him noticing these hand signals and thinking that everybody was involved in the conspiracy and that everybody was out to get him, that is what gave him that clarity that he mentioned earlier. He said that it was then that he realized what he needed to do. Next, the police spoke with Abby, who they wondered if she had any part of this. They did have some information that she was also into looking into these conspiracies, and maybe she was even in on her own children being murdered. In the interviews, she told the police that both her and Matthew were researching QAnon and conspiracies, but she said that Matthew became significantly more paranoid about the people around him than she ever got. He would spend hours upon hours searching the internet, reading and posting on messaging boards, and reading about conspiracy theories. She said that he started to become worried that even the people in their church and people in their everyday lives may have all been out to get him. 
He even accused Abby at one point of being a part of the conspiracy. She described that there was one time where a friend that we discussed earlier came over to the house and they both confronted the friend about being a part of this conspiracy. They showed the friend a photo of himself when he was 13 years old, so at the time, the photo was over 10 years old. In that photo, he was making a hand signal, which I believe was a peace sign. Of course, again, the friend continued to deny that he was a part of any conspiracy. He said that he was not out to get Matthew, but of course they didn't believe him. So after that, Abby chased the friend out of the house. Officials also went ahead and searched through the Facebook messages as well between Matthew and different friends they found that there was a lot of messages from Matthew to other friends where he shared different posts about the election, Trump, and people in Trump's government saying that they're basically all trying to uncover this elitist group. Another friend who chose to stay anonymous said that Matthew would just be glued to his phone when he was on these websites. The friend said that Matthew would always send him these websites and different articles that he could find that he was obsessive with looking up this information. After seeing all of that information, it isn't thought that Abby had any knowledge or involvement whatsoever. She is a victim in all of this too. An anonymous friend of hers and Matthew's said that she was completely shocked and that she did not see any of this coming. She is absolutely devastated. The friend went on to say, quote, no one expected this, but for her, she's starting to question everything she ever knew about her husband. It's devastating. So now she's wondering what she could have done to stop it. Those questions are going to haunt her. If she had any idea that he was believing all this, she would have helped him get help, but she didn't know. And now the worst has happened. She even went on to say that she's scared that she may have been next since Matthew accused her of being in on the conspiracy and having serpent DNA. So after all of this information was discovered, of course, Matthew was charged with two counts of first degree murder and he pled not guilty. Family members came out after all of this and they all said that they had no idea that Matthew was even capable of doing something like this. They are all very confident that he just had this psychotic break where he just snapped. While awaiting in prison, Matthew wrote a two-page letter to a long-term friend to basically talk about the things that he had worked through since being in prison. He wrote in part, quote, I was deceived. I was deceiving myself. I know now that the serpent DNA thing was a delusion in my own mind. I made myself believe something that wasn't there. He went on to say that he didn't have access to the internet. He didn't have access to all of those conspiracy sites that he had been obsessed with before the murders. In relation to his beliefs in the conspiracies, he wrote that he's starting to see through all of it now. He continues, quote, there's a lot to unpack, but I have to figure out what I really believe, but I don't have access to information anymore, so I'm having to use my own mind to figure things out. So, as Matthew awaits his trial in jail, the prosecution has come out to say that they are not pursuing the death penalty in this case. Federal prosecutors pondered whether he was actually insane at the time of the murders, or if he's just trying to use the insanity defense as a way to plea his case. The officials who are writing up the affidavits in this case all put that all of these different things, the conspiracies, all of the different things that he was believing in, and if that's kind of paired with a mental illness, that this could be a result, and that it could be that he genuinely thought that he wasn't actually doing something wrong, and that he truly was insane at the time that these murders were committed. So as of right now, that's where the case stands. I haven't been able to find any information regarding a psych evaluation. I'm pretty confident that based on just his behaviors and what we know, that there was one done, but I don't know the results or what will come of it. I'm hoping we find out more once this trial starts, but if not, we may never know if there really was any sort of mental health issues going on. I think it's pretty obvious that he was delusional. He clearly was so sucked in and so absorbed into these conspiracies that I do truly believe that he thought that he was somehow helping his children and the world by murdering them like this. But at the same time, he said himself that he knew what he did was wrong. 
He clearly took them away to harm them. He wouldn't tell Abby where he was going or what he was doing. So to me, he knew that what he was doing was not okay. But I am curious to know if he had any sort of underlying mental health issues, if he does have a diagnosable condition, things like that, just to see what was truly going on in his head when all of this was happening. Because again, some of the stuff you really just can't make up and I don't think that someone would do something like this and just make all of these things up from the get-go. That just doesn't make any sense. So I'm really looking forward to any more information that comes out as this case proceeds. Either way, it is just so devastating seeing all of these children being murdered all of the time. I am all for conspiracy theories and honestly, and I might sound crazy too, but I do personally believe that there are a lot of high-ranking government officials who prey on children. I think it's almost common knowledge at this point and I think a lot of people believe in that. But letting yourself get so far into these conspiracies that they take over your entire life and you start thinking that the world is out to get you, that's just no way to live. And I just don't know if a mentally healthy person can get themselves to that point. But I am really looking forward to hearing what you all think about this entire case. Do you think that he had some sort of severe mental illness that led him to thinking that he was actually saving the world? Do you think that all of this was because of the conspiracy theories alone? Or do you think that he wanted to murder his children for some other reason and that he's just using this as a cop-out? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and fill out the Google form that I have listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week, stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!